Hello, product people. Welcome to the Product for Product podcast, hosted by Matt Green, data advocate and product manager, and Masha Mikanovsky, product leader and author. Our goal is to serve the product community by helping you find products that can help make your work in product management easier. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Product for Product podcast. Welcome back. On today's episode, we'll be discussing how the diagramming tool Lucichart can be used for UX, UI, and wireframing. We are happy to have Faith Peterson on the show to talk about her experiences with Lucichart. Faith is a senior product manager at Interview Stream. So welcome to the show, Faith. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Hey, Mache. Hey, Matt. Hey, Faith. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And we usually start with um, introducing our guests. So if you can introduce yourself, who you are, your product management experience, et cetera. Sure. Um, well, as Matt said, I'm currently a senior product manager at Interview Stream. Uh, we have a video interviewing product that I'm uh, solely, I guess, the sole owner of. Uh, I got started in this work longer ago than I care to admit, 20 plus years. <laughs> mm-hmm. And through most of that time, my most of my roles have had a significant user experience uh, component. I think that's partly because when I first got into this work, I was doing, I was in a role where I was visiting a lot of people at their desk who were having problems with software. And invariably they would blame themselves and they would, th- they would say things like, you know, I'm just too old to get this. I'm not smart enough to get this. You know, I'm never going to understand it. I must have done something wrong to create this problem. And mm-hmm. I had been a computer hobbyist. I taught myself to program. I knew enough to know that, uh, well, first of all, just on a human level, a tool that that makes people feel that way when they try to use it, there's something fundamentally wrong there that needs to be fixed. Mm-hmm. And I knew that software didn't have to be that hard. There, we were just not doing the right things in the design of software to enable people to use the use software tools successfully. So that's mm-hmm. why I got into this kind of work. And so throughout, I've been gravitating toward roles where I can be involved in uh, user experience and design decisions uh, and either working with dedicated designers or in, you know in some cases, you know I've been the primary person, not mm-hmm. at the visual design level, um, but, at the level of you know what's the navigation what's the information design user you know, what's experience the approximate layout on the screens and so forth so yes mm-hmm. exactly and so for that reason i've always incorporated some form of wireframing or you know user experience diagramming into my work so that's actually very experienced that you have that um, i'm sure a longer experience in that than uh using lucy chart so maybe take us take us through some of that uh, how you have done it before you use Lucy Chart and then yep. you know how Lucy Chart helps you with that. Sure. So in general, I'm a big fan of whatever works and use the simplest thing that works. Yep. Use whatever you have available to you. Uh, so I've used you know whiteboards and taking pictures to share. Same with mm-hmm. paper. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of software tools. Um, you know, way back in the day, I used Visio or OmniGraffle. I've also used PowerPoint with some success after they introduced, you know, hotspots and you could link different slides together. Uh, you, know, you could yep. create kind of, yeah, you could create kind of rudimentary uh, wireframes and rudimentary prototypes that way. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times I was using other tools and sort of repurposing them for, for this purpose. Mm-hmm. Um it became it became a problem though to not be able to share easily with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always having to you know have a local copy on my machine and then either publish it out or make copies for other people to look at and yep. you had to keep all those things current. So that was uh, a big problem. Yep. Mm-hmm. So Lucidchart, I think I think was founded in 2010. I started using Lucidchart in 2012, mm-hmm. and I think they were one of the first applications, web applications for this. I think immediately after others came along, Mural, I think was next. And mm-hmm. of course, now we have a lot more. But I was on this Lucid Chart bandwagon early. <laughs> uh, and it kind of immediately solved that problem of sharing and currency of the 
of the documents. I don't think they added UI and UX templates until later, but I was already used to making boxes and arrows that represented whatever I wanted. So that you know, central source of truth, like this is the document and anyone who accesses it is always getting the current version. Mm -hmm. um, that already was a big plus. As time go has gone on and Lucidchart has matured, they've added more and more capabilities like hotspots and actions, layers, um, being able to um, really have a lot of control over the styles of shapes and text and so forth. Um, now you can even save styles so that if you have a particular look or you you want to mimic or emulate a style that you're already using in your product, you can do that. Um, so as time has gone on, I've relied on it more and more. Its DNA is kind of in that business and technical diagramming world. They mm -hmm. One of the very first things you could do was import a Visio diagram. That's how they started, right? Yeah. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. And... But they've since expanded on that with all these other templates and tools. And you have your choice of working in uh, a page-based view, a uh, kind of what they call you know, sort of an extensible pages or a canvas. Uh, you can create presentation slides on the page, kind of like you can do yeah. in Figma. Um, you can you have grids and guides that you can use just visually yeah. yourself or you can snap to them. So it's become for me a very rich tool where mm -hmm. I can collect all the kind, different kinds of diagrams that I'm creating in the course of a project in one Lucidchart document so that they're all together. My domain model, my navigation flows, my wireframes, anything else that I might have had to create brainstorming diagrams, they're all together in one spot. And that makes it easier for me and for others. And I'm also not trying to incorporate a lot of different tools into my stack. I really don't like to. I like to have kind of one tool that, yeah. you yeah. know, I don't want to have a whole smorgasbord of 20 tools that are, you know, just kind of point solutions for one kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. I think it also makes it easier for working with my team because mm -hmm. they also only have to know one kind of tool. And it's very similar to other tools that people in you know business or else in software development have used. Right. So for all those reasons, it's been really powerful for me and I'm, you know, continuing to use it. Very interesting. Uh, uh, you raised a very interesting point over there. You know, the last one about having one tool versus many tools. We talked about it many times in, in the uh, podcast uh, because uh, some people like uh, specialty tools that does something very well, but integrate with others. And some people like one platform that does it all. So that's that's um, an interesting point there that we see we see across many different types of tools. Um, the other one is actually something more personal to me. In the previous place where I worked, we had both Miro and uh, Lucy Chart, and I was in the Miro camp, and we have other people in the Lucy Chart camp. Hmm. And, <laughs> and I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, one of the things that draw me away from Lucy Chart was just the name. Because I thought uh, that Lucy Chart is for charting. It's not for all of those those things that you said. So maybe this, I mean, this is definitely my bad, not <laughs> checking it deeply uh, enough, but I kind of really liked Miro. So I was gravitating towards Miro. But um, I, I didn't even realize that um, you mentioned Lucy Chart, you can actually do hotspots. So you can actually do yeah. some type of uh, prototyping, which... Um, I don't believe, believe Miro has that feature. So that that's uh, very interesting. Can you elaborate on this a bit more? How how do you do that in uh, Lucy Chart? Sure. The uh, yeah, and I agree with you. I think the branding, um, you know, kind of having their roots in that technical diagramming, I think doesn't currently express all the things you can do with it. I agree. So I think mm -hmm. that is an obstacle. They've added a new product, Lucid Spark. Yes. That is, you know, similar to Miro, and you can export from your Lucid Spark board to yeah, a Lucid great. Chart diagram. So, yeah. all, so I think they're trying to kind of hit that Miro Miro spot as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. I think a lot of people just don't realize what Lucid Chart can do, especially designers who have come up using design tools like Figma or Sketch or even Illustrator mm -hmm. or Photoshop. And I think, in general, with tools, people kind of get stuck on the tool that they're using instead of 
thinking about the results they're trying to achieve. Absolutely. And so, but anyway, you asked uh, specifically about hotspots and actions and how you know to do that. So there's a couple different ways people new to Lucidchart can rely on a library of templates that they provide that there's just a variety of web layouts or mobile layouts that are just part of the library that you can just pick up as a starting point. Mm-hmm. I don't usually use those. I usually build things up for my own, you know, for my own shapes. The one exception is I don't usually use the full page or full device templates, but I will use widgets that they provide for UI controls. Mm-hmm. With you, some of those actually have some features. For example, if there's a drop down, you can configure it to have, however, yeah. number of, you know, number of elements in that drop down that you want. Mm-hmm. You can say which one is currently the actively chosen element. Yeah. So let's say you have five. You can say three is currently selected, yeah. and you can enter values for those. At the most simple level, in Lucidchart, any shape can be a hotspot. And Mm -hmm. then you could configure an action that will link from that hotspot to an external link to a web page or document uh, to another page in the same Lucidchart document Mm -hmm. uh, to a layer, uh, which I think is kind of the most, uh, maybe one of the most powerful things for prototyping because you can use different layers to represent different states of the application. Mm -hmm. And then you can use an action on a hotspot to, you know, toggle or navigate between those layers. One of the simple ways that I do it, even without being clickable, is in their wire flow templates, they have, actually, I don't remember if this is a native shape or if it's something I created, but, you know, if you place, I could place a circle over the source a, a spot on my wireframe where you would click and create a line that connects that to the target, what would be the result of clicking on that. And then you can can make those things clickable, but you can also just create a prototype that's more visual that you can, where you can see holistically all the different states and elements and then see how they're connected and how you would navigate between them. I think I think uh, that wire flow model has been really powerful for the teams I work with uh, because they can kind of in one view see the different states and the different views that are going to have to be created, but they can also see how they relate to each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I've, start, I've recently started using Loose Chart myself. I like those uh, examples you're mentioning because to your point, yeah, when I think about Loose Chart, I was thinking about, oh, you know, user flows, diagrams. But as you're saying, it's really it really does offer so much more. And so yeah. when you when you do all of these um, different hotspots, etc., you can then give users the the ability to try it or to run it on their own and see their you know test it basically. Yeah, if you well, you can export the diagrams, and then mm-hmm. uh, depending on how you export it, people can interact with those hotspots and navigate with them. Oh, I see. Yeah, some of the UI stuff is really approaches some of the capabilities of a tool like Mockups or Balsamic um, in the way that you can configure some of the UI widgets and yeah. really kind of control how they're expressed in the diagram. Uh, so that's part of why I haven't really felt the need to, to continue using a special purpose tool like that uh, because Lucidchart does most of that Mm-hmm. Plus, in other tabs in the document, I can have my concept model and I can have my business process model and my user journey right. and have all of that in other tabs in the same document. And that's been really working well for me. But if somebody were using another tool for either for their process modeling or for their you know, wireframing, Lucidchart can still be kind of a home base for that because of its ability to link out to other documents and other resources. You also mentioned the uh, presentation slides, the ability to make presentation slides. I like that a lot too. And it it does link to PowerPoint as well. So those are some things that I've, and, and the ability to export in various formats. And I've liked all that stuff. I've, I've had to use quite a bit of that when it comes to displaying uh, flows and, and you know mockups and stuff like that. Um, it's been really beneficial. So I think they are heading in the right direction on all that stuff. 
Yeah, I think you can also export to Google Slides. Yep. Um, there's integrations with uh, Jira, so the diagram can be the Lucidchart diagram can be embedded in a Jira ticket uh, if if you use Jira. Even if you export by, by PDF, you can interact with everything except layers, but you can have you can use links and so forth even in a PDF export. So. You know, there's a lot of power there once you, you know, if you take the time to kind of explore and work with yeah. it. Um, and the templates do give people a leg up. Yeah, the templates are really good. They've been really helpful. <laughs> They've been really helpful to get up and, and not having used it before. I, I was like, let me get a template. And they had a lot really great templates out there uh, to give you a starting spot to work with. Yeah. Uh, especially when it came to the UI UX stuff uh, and wireframing. So um, do they have um, also... Um publicly available, I mean, um, templates that are created by the public. So it's like a library that both templates are from Lucy charts themselves, but also anyone can add their own. Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. You Well, I know that you can add your own. Mm -hmm. um, you can create your own templates and your own shape libraries. I don't, I haven't seen uh, kind of like community source templates. When you mm -hmm. go into Lucy chart, there's the templates they provide, there's, and then there's your whatever your personal documents and templates are. I don't, I don't know if there's maybe a community out there. Uh, maybe there's a Lucidchart Reddit, but I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gone to look. Like I said yeah. earlier, I'm, I don't personally use a lot of templates. Uh, I often find that what I'm trying to do doesn't really fit well with the paradigm that whoever. Yeah. The template designer. Yeah. Then you you know, whatever they right. thought. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a lot more likely to create a shape and sort of like a adjust corner radius on a rectangle or adjust mm -hmm. the line style or whatever it is I need to do. Um, and then mix it in with the widgets as opposed to using the wireframe template itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, that way I get it, I get the benefit of their UI widgets that are so configurable. But I, it's sometimes just a little bit harder than it needs to be to kind of take a template and morph it into what I want. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a very personal thing. Some people, like Matt, you were saying, it really worked well for you, especially as a getting started tool. Yeah. And so I would encourage people to do that if that works for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like having the flexibility of kind of starting from a different starting point. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's a good point. The template, I was, it was a good starting point place but yeah i did have to peel it back some because i didn't want to be confined to that template so i did i kind of use that as my foundation but like right. you're saying i did have to peel it back to say i don't want it to be exactly like this yeah um, and so but it gave me a good starting place yep yeah and it's usually the case um i see it almost with every tool uh the more um you gain experience and you know what you want to do um the less you need to use templates really. yep yeah. The nice thing is it is really easy, I think, to, to get up and running with it. You can almost start using it right away if you've used any kind of visual tool at all. Yep. Um, because there's a shape palette that you just drag shapes on and you connect them with lines. So if you've done used any tool that has boxes and arrows of any sort, you can be productive pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Besides the templates, they have a pretty good library of... Uh, of videos that range from like a minute up to five or six minutes that give very clear tutorials on various mm -hmm. features. Um, and in their help center, they have kind of a lot of, you know, documents and information there. And one of the favorite things I like, and I'm seeing this trend in a lot more products, is a menu search. Uh, Lucidchart introduced this fairly recently and you didn't, they didn't really need it at first because the product was a lot simpler to start with. Mm -hmm. Now it's so powerful that it can, be, even I sometimes forget, like, where was that feature? Yeah. I used it three months ago. I want to use it again. <laughs> yes. So they have a menu search and that's really helpful yeah. too. I've used that quite things. a bit. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've searching for buttons and uh, different tables and different, different things, being able to search for it. And you can either have an icon or the the image and be able to drag that in uh that's been very helpful yeah mm -hmm. yeah good um tell us a bit about the collaboration aspect of lucy chart uh because uh, that was also one of those things that we find very useful for 
uh, UX and um, uh, wireframing tools. Uh, because usually you don't do it on your own. You have you want to get feedback from other people. Other people want to participate. Yes. And that is an area where there's a really clear distinction between a tool like Miro or Lucid Spark and Lucidchart. Mm -hmm. Lucidchart does have some uh, features to enable teams to cooperate. Anyone can, you can invite anyone to view a document. People, they can leave comments. Uh, I use it a lot in real time where maybe we're having a discussion, but maybe not everyone has sufficient access to edit the document. So a lot of times we'll talk and I'll be kind of everyone's hands. That was more useful before tools like Miro were wide, you know, were readily available. So the thing with Lucidchart is that in order to edit the document, you have to have a user account, like a paid account in your team. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you can view and you can leave comments but maybe not necessarily do all the free form um, like sticky noting and affinity grouping and stuff like that, where yep. you're co where the people you're cooperating with can have their own hands on and do that for themselves. Uh, so I think that's a real strength of a tool like Miro or like Lucid Spark because you get much more direct participation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What seems to be um, maybe a productive Avenue and I think the Lucid people recommend this for, for the flow between their two tools is to maybe start with that participatory idea generation kind of cluster around some consensus, uh, particularly if you're working on UX deliverables like mapping the user journey or like what are current pain points in the current user flow. You want a lot of participation for stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, when you're getting more towards designing the you know, experience in the application, uh, I think there's still a lot of value on the mirror side, but I think the value becomes a little bit um, more balanced. The At some point, you have to create something that represents what your like 2B state is going to be. And I think that's the point where even if you've done a lot of participatory idea generation and distillation in a tool like Miro or Lucid Spark, coming over to Lucid Chart to say, okay, I've heard all your ideas. And this would be whether it was me or somebody else doing the wireframing. Okay, we've mm -hmm. all worked on the ideas and the pain points and some ideas for what a good solution might be like. Let's actually get down to uh what this would actually concretely look like if we translate it into, you know, views or pages or however you want to think about it mm -hmm. in our application. Um, and then kind of present that back or share that back to the group mm -hmm. for feedback. Like if we solve for that pain point this way, or if we address that thing, you guys all said this information should go together with these actions. Is this what you meant? Here's a, here's a representation of a page that does that is this what you what you mean mm -hmm. um so i think lucid chart is superior to something like miro when you really want to create something that looks somewhere between low and medium fi i mm -hmm. guess mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um i want it to be a realistic representation of how the app is going to look even if it's not visually as refined mm -hmm. i still want it to represent for people when you click this this is what's going to happen mm -hmm. when you swipe this the next thing you see is going to be this mm -hmm. um and i want that thing to look a lot like what they are probably going to experience if they say yes that's what we mean the actual final design might look different it might even have different controls or different uh, kind of specific layout, but it would still be kind of recognizable as a representation of this sort of mid-fi thing that everybody looked at and said, yes, the flow between those things makes sense and what you see makes sense when you get there and what you can do from that state also makes sense. Um, 
So I think that's a good jumping off point then for somebody who's going to take that and do a more detailed design. And I'll just say briefly, because you will probably want to follow up and take take the conversation a certain way. But when I've worked with designers, usually they have been people who have also been front-end developers. And they're thinking more about uh, like the really final re refined visuals and layout. And they're thinking more about structuring maybe their Figma file to create assets and other things that they can export to use in the development process. Yeah. And I've kind of found that people who are sort of used to working that way or maybe kind of starting in Figma, I've seen some who do start from a more fluid or less refined state. But I've also seen some, and I think the tool encourages this, see some who get too quickly to something that is kind of too hardened and too hard to change. Yep. Yep. So Lucid Chart, I think, fills a kind of a nice middle ground where you can create something that is pretty close to what you're going to end up getting, get consensus from stakeholders. Um, but it's clear that it's not the final thing. It's right. still low enough fi that nobody could imagine that it's actually the way it's finally going to look. Yeah. And that's kind of an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's where I'm using it the most of these days is where I'm bringing in something that looks like the application and then I'm kind of whiting it out and then adding what I want into it. It's not a finished product, but I'm very visual and yep. I just have to get it out and get my thoughts out in a visual way. And yep. it allows me to do that and allows me to then communicate that to someone on my team who can come see it and be like, okay, I see where we're heading. This is by no means the finished product but it, it at least gets my thoughts out in a visual way outside of having to read a ticket. So we, well, we and sometimes I find that, you know, now that I actually, I'm trying to work this out, I actually see this thing I thought was going to yeah. be great actually will not work. Yes, exactly. That's it. That's, that's exactly it. Yep. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yep. That's it. We we talked about a bit about this risk um, on the episode with about Figma with Queenie that uh, when you start it in Figma, some people, especially if they have designer uh, experience or designer background, uh, you tend to go to the hi, um, hi-fi already. Yeah. Uh, and then it, it looks like uh, the real thing and it becomes, people become stuck with that. Yeah. So, yep. so that's definitely an advantage of having another tool in the way that um, does not even give you that ability <laughs> to, <laughs> to go exactly. so, so, so high, high fidelity. And then um, towards the collaboration, um, I actually, noticed in the past that designers that I worked with, they like to have, you know, they like to take their time. They like to use their tools without the noise of people around them, uh, where I'm the opposite, where mm -hmm. I prefer to work with more people in yeah. the room to get things done, because then I kind of uh, feed on everyone's ideas, yep. everyone's uh, ideas feed on each other. And then um, I feel that we make much more progress in that there is lots of many, many small iterations in one hour. So I, I like to do things like, let's move this here, let's move this here. Uh, Pre-COVID, I would always just do it on a whiteboard, you know, mm -hmm. yep. just uh, uh, with a marker and that's it. I try to do it with uh, Miro, or I'm sure that you, you could also do it with uh, Lucid Spark. Uh, with Lucid Chart, it's probably a bit harder and you may uh, have to just share your screen on, you know, a Zoom meeting or something like that and uh, do changes on the fly when people speak. But then there is not that interactivity if other people want to draw their ideas on the wall. There can be that interactivity if mm -hmm. if they are uh, in your sort of team, your yeah. organization's Lucid chart account, yeah. then they can edit the diagram. Um, and even if you're what I usually do is even if it's in a Zoom meeting or whatever, I share the link so that people can access the diagram. And that way, mm -hmm. if they're working on a different screen resolution or on a laptop or whatever, they can access the diagram directly to see things better. And you do have features like, you know, have everyone follow me or follow some other collaborator uh, to help get that visibility. Um, what you can't easily do if you have a lot of people in the lucid chart document like they've used a share link and they're in the document but if they don't have actually like team access it's they don't get the ability to kind of move things around themselves so mm -hmm. if i move things around it's still fast and easy 
Uh, but if you want people to directly manipulate the shapes themselves, which is really useful um, and really encourages everyone's sense of ownership in the in the process and the solution, yeah. um, Lucidchart will kind of only do that if you get everybody if everybody is a user on your license, and that's not necessarily possible for a small, fairly for a very small organization or an organization with a limited budget. Mm -hmm. In a large enterprise, you could certainly do it. Yeah. Nice. Now we always ask our guests, you know, what is it that they like about the, the three most uh, liked features in the product? What is it for you with Lucidchart? It's it's really hard to say because I use it for so many things. And so I'd have to say that that is maybe the top one, that it adapts to how my team works and the tools my team uses and what I need to do. So whether we're using behavior-driven development or domain-driven design or business process modeling or whatever we're doing, I can I can open up Lucidchart and I can do that thing. I like the multi-tab documents. Um, as I mentioned before, you create a lot of different kinds of artifacts in this work and being able to keep them all in one place is great. And then, you know, I, I use the UI features quite a lot. So I would say for me, those are the three best. Mm -hmm. Nice. I guess unless we want to call customizability a, 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 a thing because yeah. you can like you can make the shapes be whatever you want and that's really useful for me. Yeah, yeah it definitely allows a lot of flexibility and I like that. It definitely works well in that way. What are three things that you would like to see improved about it? Um, well, I really only have two. Okay. Uh, one, <laughs> one is, but they're big. Okay. Uh, one is now we've created all these things, these flow diagrams and wireframes or wire flows, but there's not an easy way to export them. I kind of feel like I'd like to export them to Figma and mm -hmm. sort of say, okay, I've handed this off now. And you can mark, you can tag versions in the version history of the document to sort of say, I handed it to the designer at this point, but there's no real way to just export it. You could share it and then they independently do whatever they do. So yeah. I'm not so sure about that. And the other thing just briefly is Lucid Spark uh, is getting a lot of their recent focus. And they've also introduced another tool called um, Lucid Scale for infrastructure and architecture diagrams. And I wonder what that's going to mean for Lucid Chart and how that whole ecosystem is going to evolve. Uh, so it's not so much a Lucid Chart feature as much as just I'm not sure what the evolution of Lucidchart will be now that they have these other specialized tools. Right. What the whole platform is going to be down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a great point, Faith. You know, when I originally started using Lucidchart, I actually opened up Lucidspark and I went and I really liked it quite a bit. And I started to build these user journeys uh, using their templates. And I started to build all these journeys out around the, the tool we're building and I got to a point, you know, I was thinking, oh, okay, great. All, everyone's going to come here and, and collaborate on it. But then I realized everyone was over in Lucidchart. And I go, oh, no. Uh, how do I get my stuff over to Lucidchart? And I built it all over here. And it was actually pretty seamless. So um, I, I did want to make note of that, that if they are, as they as they do continue to uh, develop Lucidspark, um, it, its functionality with Lucidchart worked really well for me. So when I used Figma in the past, I, I really liked FigJam. And FigJam had that too. So FigJam had that kind of migration point where, okay, we're working over here in FigJam, but we can bring it over to Figma. That way our designers could clean it up and work on it. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I thought that was really cool. So I'm really excited to see what Lucid comes up with uh, in Spark. So just wanted to make a point of that. Yeah. I would be surprised if on their own tool, they cannot do integration. That will be very disappointing. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think Absolutely. right now it's limited to export from Lucid Spark into Lucid Chart, uh, but they have been very good about evolutionarily improving their product. There's a new release every month, and almost every month has a new feature, a refinement yeah. of an existing feature, an updated template. So I wouldn't be surprised if they continue to improve that integration as well. I just haven't seen anything that says what they're plan for that is. yeah it's it's pretty new and that's what i wasn't sure about from what i could tell it was a new it was a new tool that they had it seems like it seems like every vendor out there is trying to address this issue like we, it's a fundamental issue for us in product management right how do you engage customers or stakeholders or the members of your cross-functional delivery team how do you 
engage all the members of that product team in a way that they can all participate and are all comfortable and no one is disadvantaged because the tool is specialized for some purpose that they're not familiar with. Yeah. And then how do you move from there through kind of increasingly refined representations or increasingly specific? And how much does your team even need to do that? Because I think a lot depends on whether you're for good or ill, whether your process has a lot of handoffs and now the designer is going to do a thing and the developers are going to do a thing or whether you're much more conversation based and therefore don't have a lot of handoffs and they're doing a lot more prototyping and hey I built a thing what what do you think <laughs> so but everybody's kind of I think chasing that how do you create make this process more seamless from the wide end of the funnel through from divergent thinking down to actually deciding, you know, what the solution is going to be. Mm-hmm. So I think there's some interesting things to explore between, um, you know, kind of the continuous discovery people and, you know, sort of the, the uh, prototyping people right. and the, you know, test your ideas people. I think there's a, a lot of cross-pollination happening and it seems like every tool vendor is trying to stake a claim on some part of the process, yeah. but I'm not sure that anybody has really got that end-to-end yet. Yeah, especially with the remote working uh, yeah. and, the hy- and, and the hybrid working um, that really requires you to have some tools that are more than just a whiteboard on the wall and people in the room. Yeah. And and with the, uh, companies moving to hybrid uh, situations, that will be even more interesting to see how do they do that. Because uh, in, in if you are in the office, you could maybe grab the whiteboard and and yeah. do that like how we used to do. Yeah. But then you still have some people working remotely, and uh, that will be uh, that's always the the tricky part that I see in the hybrid model. There you go. That's when you take a picture of the whiteboard and then some AI comes in and, and maps it into maybe <laughs> <laughs> and that's a future state, but yeah, maybe. maybe maybe there's something like that one day down the road. So yeah. Well to me to me it's also the fundamental of why come to the office in a hybrid uh fashion if some yeah. people are not in the office. That's I right. can do the Zoom meeting with them from home. I then go to come to the office to do the Zoom meeting with them. Uh, that's true. So so it's like <laughs> Yeah, but that's a that's a whole different discussions. Maybe we have to, <laughs> maybe we'll have to talk about the tools for that. You know, yeah, that's, that's a good one point. of our yeah. episodes. Yeah, yeah. That would absolutely be good. perfect. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot about the company itself. Um, how do you uh, see them? Are they? Um, do you deal with them? Do you have to contact them? Are they supported? I don't think I have had to contact them directly in all my years of using the product. Oh wow. Um, which means and that I, it's a really intuitive product and it works. That's what it means well, to me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe for me, because I mean, I had used Visio and OmniGraffle before and I had used, you know, I had tried Balsamic and mockups and a bunch of other tools. Mm-hmm. And I've been told that I'm really good at, what do they call it? Not, they don't call it sideways thinking, but I forget what the name of it is where you could take things you learn in one situation and easily apply them to other situations that have the same pattern or structure. So I'm just, as an individual, good at saying, okay, applications like this tend to have this kind of feature. This application probably has that feature. How do I find it and what do they call it? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a very easy learning curve. I don't know... I don't know how much that would be true for folks who haven't, you know, who haven't had prior experience. I suspect it would not be that challenging because what you can sign up for a free plan. So you don't need to contact them to actually get started. You just sign up. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you go on the individual paid plan, you just give your payment information. So you're kind of automatically up and running. And then when you make your first document, you have a, a toolbox, a tool palette, and you have a properties palette. So you could just start experimenting if you want. As mad as you were talking about earlier, you can use the templates to any extent you want. You can even start your whole Lucid chart diagram, your whole document. When you say file new, kind of just like with Google Docs, you can choose to start with a document template 
or you could just start without a template, depending on your comfort level. They do have a lot of videos. Um, they have a YouTube channel where you can see some of those, but they're also available in their help center. They do have, uh, there's a chat bot uh, at their site. If you go to the help center, there's a little chat box. Mm -hmm. um, there's help inside the application that, so you don't have to go to the help center. If you just open help in the app, you can just type what you're looking for and it'll suggest help articles that might help you. And because of the version history, I think it really is safe to experiment. Mm. So you can yeah. look at the history and you could just go back to a prior point. If you find you, you've painted yourself into a corner. Yes. You could just go back to a different I've used spot. that. A few times. Right? I've used it a few times. Yep. This is a good safety net, right? <laughs> it's very good. It's it's nice knowing it's there to catch you for sure. <laughs> yep. So I haven't found it to be uh I mean the company's been around since 20, I think they introduced the product in 2010. And I've found it to be easy, like easy enough to use that you know I've been able to either figure it out or apply other things that I've learned from other products. Mm -hmm. There are a couple little detail points that are a little bit i don't know if finicky is the right word but there are there are a couple like really really little detail points like let's say in a text box you want to change the spacing between paragraphs if you use hard returns inside your text box well that's something 95 percent of people are not going to try to do in lucid chart so to me, it's not a weakness that that might be challenging to figure out because 95% of people are not going to need or want to do it anyway. So that's where I find that I run into little speed bumps because there's just some detail there or esoteric thing that I'm trying to do that most people aren't likely to want to try to do. Mm -hmm. nice. That's because I, I try to wring every bit of value out of the tool I use <laughs> before I go looking for another one. So that's, that's how I run into stuff like that. Yeah, perfect. To summarize it, it does seem like um, it's it's a great product if you didn't even have to contact them. Um, it does also talk to your abilities as a user, but uh, that's that's um, that's something else for sure. Well, I think um, any tool that you use for you know five or ten years, you're going to become accomplished at using. So mm -hmm. I would encourage people to sign up for the free plan and try it out, particularly yep. if you've come up from the business side. If your past experience has is, has not been with uh, a design tool like Illustrator or Figma, and your if your past experience has been with um, what is it, Gliffy or Drawio or Visio or OmniGraph, well, if you've been coming up kind of more out of that kind of tool, mm -hmm. I would say definitely give Lucidchar a try and yeah. it, try to extend your skills into the UI realm. Um, if you have come up from the Sketch Figma side, like Matt, you're finding. You can get, you can do some UI UX things and some of them are going to be similar, but it's not going to operate. The interaction paradigm is completely different than a right. tool like Figma. Right. Yeah, I agree. And that that's one of the determining factors. I think when you do sign up is what are you trying to accomplish? I, I, you know, if, if I had started off just trying to look at something simply, just trying to get something up and running. Lucid chart is a really good tool for that, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a really low, low barrier of entry. Bigman does have a higher barrier, I think, because it does those other things. And so just from the experience of it, um, it could be a little more intimidating for someone who's brand new to wireframing, brand new to UI UX. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas a lucid chart, you know, you can get in and start playing with it pretty quickly. Did really find that uh, an advantage for me having not used it before. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Ad advice for any tool get in experiment don't be afraid of the software and if yeah if something goes wrong either re you know revert to a prior state or no matter what one of my mottos is it's never the user's fault mm -hmm. if you feel like something went wrong it's not you the yeah. software let you do something yeah that the software shouldn't have let you do or should have supported your desire to do it better. Uh -huh. So experiment and don't blame yourself if things don't go the, exactly the way you want. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Thanks for saying yeah. that. And at that note, um, I think we are ready to wrap up. Uh, where can we people uh, reach out to you and uh, uh, chat with you? 
I think the best way for most people would probably be a, be via my LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. um, uh, linkedin.com slash IN slash Faith Peterson. Mm -hmm. uh, I monitor my messages there all the time. And I think, I think my contact information for email, I don't know if that's like publicly available, but um, I'll always see a LinkedIn message. Perfect. Anything else you would like to share with us today? I'm just really glad to have the chance to talk with you guys and mm -hmm. um, especially to uh, you know, share some information about a, a tool that I rely on um, mm -hmm. almost every day. And I'm you know, just excited about using it and you know, being able to share that enthusiasm and nice. whatever insight I can share that might help other people get value from that tool as well. I'm just glad to have that opportunity. So thank you guys for having Absolutely. me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you thank so you much so for much. joining us. We really appreciate it, Faith. And thank you all the listeners. We really appreciate you as well. Uh, please keep sending feedback and support and we'll keep uh, moving forward. Until next time, have a great day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.